Hello and welcome to All of the Classics Podcast. I'm your host, Hope Sears. Today on the podcast, I have Kathy fuller Seely. She is a history professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and she has a textbook all about Jack Benny and the golden age of American radio comedy. If you can't afford a textbook or don't want to feel like you're at school, you can download it on Kindle for about 20 bucks. So without further ado, Kathy fuller Seely. First of all, I want to welcome you to the podcast. Um, and I was reading about you, and uh, you're a professor. Where are you a professor at again? I teach at University of Texas at Austin. When did you become a fan of Jack Benny? Well, um, a long time ago. But when I was about um, 10 or 11, watching all those old black and white movies on television back in the day, I really got interested in 1930s culture. And I, uh, 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 I got my grandmother to buy me this really great series of books, uh, the Time Life series, This Fabulous Century. And I started with the volume on the 1930s so that I could learn about, oh, Gone with the Wind, and as I said, all those great 1930s movie stars. Well, they had a chapter about radio. And in the chapter, uh, so I learned about War of the Worlds, and, you know, Orson Welles and all that, and there was this picture uh, on a double page of uh, two gentlemen fighting it out, looking like they were going to attack each other. And it turns out that was Jack Benny and Fred Allen. And so um, they had uh, a little bit of, uh, of verbiage from the feud, and I said, I want to learn more about this. But this was about 1970, 1971. And there wasn't the internet, and I'd not been lucky enough to grow up in an area where his old, where Jack Benny's television show was being rerun. So to learn about the radio shows, I found the old, the Liberty Magazine had um, a one ants in the back where you could write away for catalogs of radio shows on cassette tape. And so I wrote away to this guy in Seattle who sent me a catalog, and um, for seven dollars of my very hard-earned babysitting money, I could order one cassette that had one 30-minute show of Jack Benny on one side and one episode on the other. And so uh, through a laborious process, I gathered about ten episodes and uh, listened to them constantly. Uh, Those were episodes from the early 1950s. Dragged my brothers into it, and so um, that's how I became a Jack Benny radio fan. But it took me a long time uh, again to then connect that to go to listen to all the rest of the shows and things like that. That's really cool, though. Like, that's a lot of dedication because uh, I've always grown up with it's just there. So, oh, lucky you! I know. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can get many more people to say it's just there right and we should all listen to it so so was that was your love of Jack Benny kind of what inspired you to go into history or is it um was there more to it than that that's a great question. I, I loved entertainment, both uh, radio and old movies. I, I, I laugh that I've been drawn to media that are incomplete. So I like silent film that you can't hear and radio that you can't see. Um, and indeed, that um, led me to go read every book I could find in the library about old stars and about what you know um, uh, making radio and making movies back in the day was about. And yeah, it led to the, both that and um, all those little House on the Prairie books, uh, mm-hmm. uh, where I said, "Oh, how could I live in Minnesota or North Dakota in the 1880s or whatever?" Right. Um, <laughs> I, I was really interested in entertainment history and history from the bottom up, but that's not what capital H history was when I was growing up. History was about presidents and wars and generals and things that famous white guys did. So, um, uh, it took a while for history to catch up with me. Uh, I, I majored in history. It took till I got to graduate school, till I found a professor who said, um, no, history doesn't have to be about generals and wars. You can actually study, um, uh, uh, film 
and radio and broadcasting and entertainment history and their audiences. And I said, what? I didn't know you could do that. And he said, go for it. Is that more along the lines of fan studies? It's all connected. You're right. Um, I consider I started out with a social and cultural history of um, audiences of entertainment. But indeed, um, uh, uh, fan studies is all about uh, uh, examining the relationship between um, uh, uh, media enthusiasts and their favorite uh, uh, stars and products and things like that. Fan studies tends to be very much of today. Um, I'm uh, very interested. There's a growing number of scholars interested in fan studies of the past. The problem is you can't go back and interview people who are, right. you know, are sort of long dead. So yeah. um, fan <laughs> studies of the past leads you to things like finding fan magazines. And, and um, scrapbooks and, and memories of, of people who were fans in their youth and things like that. So it's, it's a bit of an archaeological dig. Right. But it's one that we've never had, like, TV and movies until really recently. So it's kind of, I think it's easier to kind of know what's going on versus, you know, when we just had books to go off of. So that, I think that's really cool. This is true. Well, it's off the topic, but you can actually study the history of book readers in the 1800s. Um, you find somebody who had a big collection of books and did they actually write in them? Did they mark things and things like that? So, oh, uh, but it's all interesting. So, and I'd love to know how you became interested in Jack Benny, but you may talk about that a lot elsewhere, but I'd love to know. Oh. Oh, gosh, where did I become interested in Jack Penny? I think where it was is I'm a big fan of comedy in general. And so I had a bit of a crush on Steve Martin. I love Johnny Carson. And so when so I went back and I traced where their comedic interest was and where who inspired them and it was all traced back to Jack Benny and so I was like well who the hell is Jack Benny I don't know who Jack Benny is and so sure. um I was very fascinated um when I bought a um Johnny Carson DVD uh with like Johnny Carson and friends and it had um Jack Benny and then it had George Burns, and that kind of sparked my interest. And then soon afterwards, um, Jack Benny and George Burns were appearing on, uh, what was it? The It's not Decades, it's Antenna TV. And so I started watching, I started going home and watching it, and I would set my alarm for like midnight to watch it. <laughs> oh, wow! Well, that's fantastic, but... Um, it's something that reminds me we are so, uh, to be so grateful for all um, uh, the digital media, whether it's these um, the, the space on over-the-air TV for these little stations like Antenna TV to crop up and play reruns, or the fact that, say, um, um, over 700 of Jack Benny's radio broadcasts are now available free on the Internet. So I, um, I, I'm very grateful that um, new technologies are letting us explore the past more than ever. And I will do one more plug for, um, uh, if you go to the University of Nebraska website, you go to their theater department, um, and have you done this yet? Um, uh, Johnny Carson wrote the most amazing senior thesis. And he ha vocalizes it. I have it downloaded on my computer. Oh, it's so <laughs> wonderful because he sounds, he's just a 22-year-old Johnny Carson. Carson. But he did his own podcast for 1947 or whatever it is, where, and it's all about his love of Jack Benny and Fred Allen. It's wonderful. So, so there you go. So your your genealogy studies can can go a little further. So. <laughs> this is true. So I was watching some, doing a deep dive, and I found some clips of you in a Jeopardy episode. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Where you said you collect things from the World Fair. What fair, what specific fair was that and, like, why that one? Well, um, this was, that was 1989. 
and I'm the one who posted it because I love to make fun of myself that I, if you watch the whole thing, I lose in tremendous fashion. But fought it le- almost legally to try and get back on because I think they asked asked a very poor final question, and I knew the answer to it. Um, it, it was 1989, and that was the 50th anniversary of the fabulous 1939 New York World's Fair, of where they the symbols were the Trilon and the Perisphere. And so kind of obsessively, I've, uh, again, it came from that same book on the 1930s culture that that Time Life book ended with a chapter on the wonders of the future shown at that fair. And um, uh, uh, so indeed, I, I do collect things from postcards to souvenirs, but the best part of that failed experience on Jeopardy was all manner of people contacted Alex Trebek and said, hey, what about that little? What about that young woman? I'd like to um, send her stuff. I too, I went to the fair when I was 13, 14, 15. and so people from all over the country sent me the coolest stuff. That's amazing. Uh, diaries, things they collected. They sent me their, you know, I mean, they shared shared their experiences with me. So um, uh, there is a little bit of interest in history and obsession. And um, a failed television appearances that that ended up having a good ending. So, right, that's kind of amazing to get that much of a tremendous feedback. That's really cool. Um, I was wondering. I saw that you were a contributor for PBS talking about Mary Pickford and Bob Hope. I I find it impressive, especially with. Uh, so many people that uh, are experts, really, with Bob Hope, but you get to comment on on that. How does one get the chance to make that kind of contribution, and what were they specifically looking for? Boy, and you know, I'm going, um, that ended up being a group of media makers from the big PBS station in New York City whose name escapes me at the moment. And they've done a series on a sort of great white males of entertainment. Well, they were applying um, uh, uh, to do a Bob Hope episode of American Masters in connection with Richard Doglin's biography of Hope. And they were applying for um, a grant uh, of, of, from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And the NEH likes diversity. And so the NEH asked the group, hey, how come you don't have any women um, uh, among your scholars? How come you don't have any, you know, where's the diversity? And so, frankly, it started out just to get some diversity. They were pointed toward me. And so, yay, you know, we'll take any avenue we can get to get in there and make the comedy world a better place. So, um... Uh, that's how I became involved. I was happy to be one of about ten. Um, uh, 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 what do I want to say? Um, uh, scholarly references uh, uh, for the group. They didn't necessarily take my advice. Um, I, I said, please get Kermit the Frog out of there. If you see the American Masters episode, they actually have Kermit the Frog go. Bob Hope is wonderful. And oh, you don't need to. But nevertheless. I'm hoping I can get those folks. Wouldn't it be lovely to have um, a two-hour uh, Jack Benny uh, oh. American Masters episode? We so need this. Uh-huh. So that that is true. Um. So so you're very kind. It helps to be willing. Um. Uh, and it's one of those things I get once you get a track record of of having um uh, uh successfully contributed to one of these um, uh, um, uh, media-making projects, um, you get invited to do others. So I'm currently involved in a wonderful project about Mae West. And uh, so, yay! It would be be great to tell Mae West's story. Oh, my gosh. I love Mae West. Uh, She's fantastic. So I'm hoping hoping in this era of... uh, uh, of paying more attention to female comics and female perfor- outstanding female performers, that we'll get that one. But we need a Jack Benny. We need many Jack Benny things. So. Yes. Uh, to divert off subject a bit, I do I do these podcasts, but I do also do like uh, who people are, 
episodes, oh. and I did one about Mae West, and uh, I'm I'm hesitant to do Jack Benny just because I want to do it right, and there's so much to cover. So I haven't done one a video yet, but that's in the work. Well, you're right. How do you hit the highlights of a career that um, lasted so long and was so varied? Um, since the my book came out on radio, Jack Benny's radio career, I've been really interested in digging into um, the fact he spent 20 years in vaudeville. You know, that's, and um, that's, I didn't know that much about vaudeville history, and it's been great fun with the members of the uh, Jack Benny fan club, the stalwart group on Facebook, and, and wherever, everybody's been contributing, of uh, finding references to places he played, finding reviews of, uh, of, and seeing how Jack Benny shaped his character. You know, he started out at 17. And he was trying everything from, I found one episode, uh, one review where he was dancing, another re one review where he tried blackface comedy, like Eddie Cantor was doing so famously. And the review did say he's the most unsuccessful blackface performer ever. So I'm glad for all of us that he quit that after. <laughs> so... Uh, so I was reading that you teach courses in the study of comedy. Um, what do you explore? Do you explore theories, the history of comedy, um, or both? Well, well you betcha both. <laughs> um, it's a, a marvelous course. I just taught it in spring, and I had some of the best students I've ever had. Yay! Hooray for them. Um, I, uh, I'm, I mix a, a serious study of uh, philosophies of comedy. Why is something funny? Why do we laugh at things? And the most popular explanation, the one that fits the most, um, uh, fills the most buckets, is the theory of incongruity. That, um, our, that our, our mind, our eyes, as we take in things that look different, like an, if you compare an apple and an orange, there we expect, our mind expects them to be the same, and then they're different, and we notice that difference, and then you can play off that to have those differences be funny, Laurel and Hardy, big fat man, tall skinny guy. Um, uh, 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 incongruity would be saying and doing something out of place. Um, incongruity can also be uh, taking somebody uh, who's supposed to command respect or have um, dignity and yank away that dignity from them. You know, have the, uh, the comic slip on the banana peel. Um, and then you find out that Jack Benny um, um, fills all those philosophical, well, you know, his comedy is based in high theory. And it's great fun for the students to be able to take that very academic subject and then apply it to things like Jack Benny or South Park or Rick and Morty or some of the most dis sort of disgusting um, a ridiculous and childish comedic things we can find, and then they go, whoa, you can do both at once. You can you can laugh and think. And it really impressed me that Jack Benny loved to laugh and think. Yeah. Um, so on the subject of courses in comedy, uh, I've been, like, watching a lot of interviews with different comics and stuff, and I've, I've found that there's many comics like Seinfeld that feel like um, you are you can't teach yourself comedy, um, you can't teach yourself, how, well, can't teach yourself how to be funny, but there's comedians like Steve Martin that have indicated in his Masterclass series that no, he, he taught himself because he noticed those differences and he realized he had to be original. Um, what kind of camp do you fall under? Is comedy something teachable, in your opinion? Um, I'm so envious. I haven't heard the Steve Martin Masterclass yet, but I hear it's fantastic. Um, I, I think it's a combination of both. And I hate to overplay the Jack Benny example, but oh, why not, right? Right. So, That's the um, subject. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so Jack Benny could teach anyone to become a comic. Um, so his, uh, and that is something I really enjoyed learning about, about what he could do on the radio, where you could hold the script in front of you, and he could act as a director, or in a way kind of symphony conductor around the microphone, and he could take anyone, whether it's the lady who won 
on the Walking Man contest. Um, uh, you know that that thing on the radio where she guessed that the the mystery man was Jack Benny, and then she won these incredible prizes from the Truth or, Truth or Consequences program. She didn't know comedy from you know she couldn't joke her way out of a paper bag. But what Benny could do with anybody is he could um, help them with their comic timing. In radio, he could say, here's your lines, and you say it like this, and then you wait. You wait till you see me point at you. You wait till you t- I touch my nose. You wait so he could coach someone and direct them and work with them to have the outcome seem delightfully funny. So he was a great tutor of comedy. And so uh, I think in that way, comedy can be taught. But on the other hand, I think you've got to have a kind of um, uh, uh, underlying sympathy for comedy or appreciation of it for it to stick. So maybe Steve Martin was able to become, could teach himself or learn to become a great comic because somewhere at him had a comedy funny bone or um, a kind of appreciation um, uh, for that. Um, perhaps we've all known people who don't have a funny bone, who no matter what don't appreciate jokes. I have a former mother-in-law who's one of those people, but we'll leave that where it is. But um, So some people absolutely don't get it. But, you know, I, so I, in answer, long answer to your question, so I think it is both. I think it really helps to have that underlying spark. Um, and then um, you can either discover it yourself or you can um, uh, learn from the best uh, about how to use that spark. And again, one um, again, one more Jack Benny example. What I've been learning about his early career in his teens, you know, he started out in vaudeville, uh, in vaudeville only playing the violin. It, he never told a joke. He was on. He was in vaudeville for 1911. It was not until 1919 that he ever told a joke in public on the stage. That's eight years. But what I can find, in, what we can find in reviews of even him playing the violin, his reviewers would say, "Well, he plays it with comedy." He likes to make a joke. He likes to play a funny, unexpected tune. He'll play something serious and then twist it. So I think Jack Benny, even before he he said he was way too scared to tell a joke or things like that, I think he had an appreciation and he taught himself. Again, sorry for too long an answer, but it's it's a great topic. And and indeed, with my course on comedy, um, we actually went straight to stand-up. Again, here's how new media is um, uh, making a comedy, I'm going to say a renaissance, or marvelous times in comedy, that um, uh, one can just start telling funny stories on YouTube. One can do podcasts like you're doing, and and then find an audience. And then, perhaps, the bigger an audience you get, you might get an opportunity, like Isa Ray, to go from making her um, YouTube videos to getting a chance to do a an HBO special or a Netflix series or things like that. So um, it just really interests me that um, uh, comedy is one of the best. It Comedy works great in tiny YouTube videos and small podcasts. You don't have to make a whole comic movie. And so I think it's a perfect medium um, for tweets and Twitters and Vines and, you know, and, and um, GIFs and things like that. And so it's a perfect medium for the uh, uh, variety of uh, media forms that are out there today. So, hooray. Yes, hooray. I love it. Hooray. I, I hooray. love YouTube. I think it, I think you're right. It's a good venue for comedy right now. Um, uh, you said in your textbook uh, that Benny's first sponsors fired him. What, uh, because he was looking for more creative control, um, what, what were they saying that he was disagreeing with and got him fired? Fired, yep. That's, it's certainly something he didn't like to dwell on it. You know, that's who wants to, although he was a Mm -hmm. self-deprecating person his whole life, who actually likes to dwell on the fact that you got fired by your first three sponsors. Canada Dry, his very first sponsor, is is a great example because at first in the earliest broadcast they were horrified by his uh, his comedy commercials. 
imagine taking the sacred product because they held their ginger ale. It was the champagne of champagne. ginger ale. I know, I said that to my Supposedly mom. consumed by the, yeah, <laughs> by the wealthiest people out there. And when Jack Benny tells a story about one of my favorite ones is he said, yes, we intrepid Canada Dry uh, marketers went to a factory in Kentucky and we, we took 600 factory workers. We bound them up with ropes. We beat and starved them. And then we gave them sips of Canada Dry and they said it was not bad. You know, the, the sponsors were horrified right. and they said, fire this man immediately. But the advertising agency said, but wait, you're getting lots of letters and mm -hmm. comments from the public and letters in going, oh, this is so different. This is, right. you know, you've taken, you know, you're being informal with the product. This is great. So um, one, if um, some sponsors had no funny bone. When we were earlier talking about some people had no funny bone. Sponsors <laughs> never want to have their product made fun of. And so um, they resented that and they were, um, it, it took a buffer like an advertising agency to go, um, um, really, give it some time. Really, really, it's working. Right. Uh, the second time Canada Dry interfered was they, um, somebody at, at the manufacturing uh, company said, we don't really like Jack Benny's humor. We don't think he's funny. We're going to hire another writer and have him be the main writer. And that's how in um, uh, uh, early... Um, late October, early November 1932, after he'd been on the air, what, four or five months, they just hire this guy, Sid Silvers, who just creates a, a different kind of sitcom and takes over the whole show. Well, it turns out that Jack and Mary and writer Harry Kahn said, oh, no, you don't. If you don't quit, we're going to, you know, if you don't stop this and fire this dude, we're going to uh, all quit. So they had a showdown with the sponsor and they won. But about three weeks afterward, the sponsor said, well, forget this. We're just going to not play this radio game. Uh, it's it's too difficult. A similar thing happened with their second sponsor, uh, Chevrolet of the automobiles. Yeah. It, everything was going great, but then they got a new CEO at the corporation who said, I really like polkas. I don't really like comedy. Polkas. I would much rather have our show that my company's paying for be a music show about polkas. And so he just up and fired Jack Benny. Well, this that story was then held up in advertising agency circles for 30 years about why you do not let the sponsor. You know, that's uh, this is what stories they would tell other manufacturers of be careful, don't let some idiot CEO make these kind of decisions for you. So, um, so they said they they um uh, they wanted uh, sponsors just thought they knew better than the comic did and you know and yet on the other hand they were paying a heck of a lot of money for it. Jello was paying seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in nineteen thirty four. But you uh, just imagine uh, multiply that by like a hundred. You know this is yes, that's yeah. insane. Mm -hmm. And and so. And they counted on this show back in the day. Um, if you enjoyed the comedy, it was um, fairly common knowledge that if you, the audience member, enjoyed the comedy, that you were supposed to go and, and patronize the manufacturer, buy the sponsor's product. Right. And so if, if, if Jello was not starting to fly off the shelves, all that money spent was going to be for naught. Right. It's different today now that the networks for on what's left of of regular TV, of CBS, NBC, ABC. Uh, now the sponsors only buy 30 seconds or at the most mm -hmm. one minute of a show. They don't purchase the whole, they don't sponsor the whole show. Right. So they, they, um, uh, 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 they uh, created, uh, the, the networks have created lots of middlemen there to, um, and I think we no longer uh, uh, think we're supposed to go buy the product because we enjoy the show. Although, of course, in podcasts, if I listen to a show, I'm supposed to um, go buy my Blue Apron meals or whatever right. it is. That's and same, <laughs> the and, and so. same with uh, some YouTube, like go and get this website and go and get like Audible and stuff like that. The sponsors on YouTube. Right, or my makeup, or these yeah. makeup products, mm -hmm. or these skincare products, right. or things like that. So it fascinates me that I'm telling stories from 1932. 
and yet um, the issues keep cropping up that new media, like radio was fairly new in 1932, um, enable um, uh, these ongoing issues to crop up again about um, sp- um, if, if you're going to have advertising, you know, that's, uh, people don't spend all that money for advertising just for the heck of it. They want to see results, which would be to get prominent fame notice right. for their product and sell some. And here's the entertainment that's going to do that for them. So uh, I, I think it's interesting, or at least I try to convince my students who couldn't care less about the past, that if you learn these lessons about interesting things that happened way back then, now, when it occurs in just a new medium, when you're twi- when somebody's offering to sponsor your Twitter account, what kind of issues might that raise? Or at least that's what I tell them. So. <laughs> that's that's a valid point and very very fair. It kind of gives you an advantage if you know the history of the past to deal with the new stuff that's popping. It's popping up and kind of history repeating itself. As history. Exactly. How would you like to come speak to my class? So. <laughs> Play them this podcast. <laughs> uh, so I, um, um, I was looking at the relationship with Harry Kahn, and he was a very influential writer uh, for Benny. Um, but his, their, their partnership kind of came to a boiling point, as you say. What, what kind of arguments were they having that led to him leaving? Well, this is, is so, um, it's such an interesting story. And I tend to be um, uh, rooting for Jack Benny and against Harry Kahn because he, Harry, Kahn, Harry Kahn was a salaried worker. You know, Jack Benny was paying him. You know, that's if I work in the store, you know, and you pay me, I go clerk in the store and I sell the hamburgers or I sell the milk or whatever, and then I go home and my work is done. Um, I, there's another a person you can interview named Ben Schwartz, another stalwart member of the Benny fan club, who enlightened me to Harry Kahn's point of view. Uh, and this is um, Harry Kahn um, wanted the credit he thought he deserved. For being the for being the major writer, um, Harry Kahn said, um, "If well, if, again, if this had been today, um, Jack and Harry would have had to sign an agreement where Harry um, had a, a kind of rights for rebroadcast or syndication or a, um, a continued income stream from this work he had created, like getting royalties. Right. That w- would be expected today, but." Back in the day, the relationship was, no, I just hired you to write this script. You have no rights in it afterwards. So, as I said, Ben, who is a writer, uh, um, uh, enlightened me to the writer's position, who would say, no, I created that work, even though it's a work for hire. If you were going to continue the characters, um, uh, uh, gee, I deserve some part of the future bit, because those were my characters we created here. Right. They said Jack took the position of, I'm paying you the most that anybody's getting as a radio writer. Mm-hmm. So Harry had his point of view. He said, I'm not, I've worked really hard. We've created this very successful thing. How come you're getting all the fame and I am the schlump in the cupboard? You know, who, right. who is just, who, who's, I'm not getting any credit for this. And so they, the arguments just got more heated over time as Jack Benny became like the number one comedian in radio and was making these movies based on his character and, and especially right. with Jello, you know, it's it's taken off into a nationwide phenomenon. And Harry is going, what about my aspect of it? And Jack said, but here's the, the problem, um, especially when you've created a fictional character named Jack Benny. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so it was perhaps impossible for Jack to be able to separate the fictional character and the fame for being a star versus his real person. If Jack's character had been named, you know, Silly Smith or something, and there had been a clear break, you know, the same way Jerry Seinfeld's done the the same thing for himself of creating a character with his real name. I think if if it had been a more fictional character, um, they might have been able to work out something more easily. Uh, I mean, Harry Kahn and Jack Benny. 
But like I said, so so Harry became really insistent, and he really started, you know, getting angrier and angrier and angrier, and he really started, um, uh, I don't want to, uh, uh, holding, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to hold out his position of power over Jack Benny. I am your only writer. You bow to me and my demands, or bad things will happen. And indeed, at the worst possible moment, uh, while they were on an eight-week cross-country trip. Uh, he just, uh, Harry Conn up and left Jack Benny on a Thursday night before the Sunday show with no script. Mm-hmm. Ah, you know, um. Do we have a, do we have like, uh, the broadcast of th- that one or is that lost? I think we have part of it. It's, um, uh, I, I think it exists in sort of part in, in, you know, maybe 10 or 12 minutes mm-hmm. of it. I'm going to, uh, get the script out there so that you can see the whole thing but the, for that show Jack ended up having to write it himself between Thursday and Sunday um, he called on all he, he called in a whole bunch of chips uh, he called some of his best friends and said for God's sakes I, I'm emergency I need some help mm-hmm. um, and and friends lent him some writers Jack dug into his suitcase of old vaudeville routines he invited mm-hmm. some guests um, uh, uh, to, to come and help him out and somehow he made it through that show and then then um, here is where uh, uh, his advertising agency came in handy this was Young and Rubicam and so they helped oh, it's like, oh for God's sakes let's hire some writers really quick and this is where uh, perhaps Fred Allen sent in one of his junior writers who ended up being either Ed Morrow or Bill Boulogne is it Bill Morrow and Ed Boulogne? Sorry, I always get those two mixed up. So, as I said, um, Jack, um, with the help of others, was able to assemble um, uh, a make a, a, a pinch hitting team, including um, um, Al Bosberg, to help him get back on his feet, so that he didn't. And the mo- important thing he learned was he didn't necessarily need Harry Kahn anymore. But as I said, I. I it's, it's a messy thing, and I, I do feel bad for both sides. Both sides said, um, don't let me sound like a current president who would say both sides are right. But um, uh, 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 both Khan and Benny had reasons to be angry and frustrated. I think if they were making the negotiations today, it would have all been um, uh, spelled out before they'd gotten very far in their partnership who was going to get it. It would have so. been settled by the Writers Guild. Yes, there was no radio writer skill. So, uh, you know, that's, um, there you go. As I said, we, you can you can get more of, of Harry Khan's point of view if you talk to uh, to Ben, and I'm very happy to help make that happen for you. Oh, so. great. But um, it's a great question, and thanks for asking. No, it's just history. Um, Jack, uh, so Jack Benny featured Rochester, played by Eddie Anderson, and he made, he, he helped make him one of the top paid black radio uh, stars of the time. Um, but Jack's program was often criticized for racial stereotypes. And certainly today, some of those um, stereotypes don't play out so well. But I think he was breaking a lot of good breaking a lot of barriers, um, but could he have done more at that time? Oh, uh, everybody could have done more, right? But it is, um, it's it's so interesting to me that um, uh, everyone praised Jack in the late 30s for uh, uh, the uh, relationship of, of sort of interracial friendliness and, um, and and comedy and, and treatment of, of relative equality, given that it was a, an employer-employee relationship. Even the African-American community, they were going from, you know, there are no black performers on radio, and there were almost none in film, and we're just trying to get a foothold here. So um, Jack and Eddie Anderson won all manner of honors and things like that in the late 30s, especially with that visual representation of them in the film Buck Benny Rides Again. Um, nothing better than seeing the two of them on screen um, uh, uh, interacting so informally and pleasantly with each other. Um, could Jack have done more? Well, I, I think in the, early, 
in the late 40s and early 50s. Um, uh, they had pretty, uh, the Jacks writers on radio had pretty much removed of the aspects that plagued the earlier Rochester character of having him Jones for fried chicken and be afraid of his shadow and other very stereotypical, you know, bad things in minstrel show behavior. Uh, perhaps, well, that's, it, it's hard to say because um, I could say, well, the thing to do would be to have him not be Jack's servant anymore, but co-worker in a company they established or something like that. You'd to, to go further in the 1950s, you would have had to change the relationship. Right. And yet, the Benny show was not about, they had established these relationships right. and they weren't going to change anything. So, Great. in part, uh, um, uh, we might be asking a little bit much mm-hmm. of a show to leap out of its context of the, early, of the late 40s and early 1950s. Had they made major changes to the show like that, there might have been a racist backlash right. about um, of those who were only comfortable with the Rochester character being safely the employee mm-hmm. of a white man. And to see the Rochester character have full equality with the white folks on the show might have been too much for um, uh, uh, extremely conservative and racist whites. So I guess I can't you know, while we could we could wish for a lot of things, you could understand the conservative nature of uh, sponsor American Tobacco, Lucky Strikes, going, no, don't mess with a good thing. Right. Uh, nevertheless, on the radio show and in television, um, the relationship between Jack and Rochester really did turn into a kind of interracial odd couple. Hmm. Um, yeah. it's, it's lovely to see, and it was certainly... Um, better than anything else that was happening on radio or TV in the 50s. So um, that's where, indeed, if we're talking history, um, it gets complicated, right? That that we could say, wow, it's so much better than some other things that were going on. Everything it's in no way easier. perfect. Yeah. And if we were trying to do the same thing today, right. Everything's we, easier we'd have, it, in the same way that they said in the last Jack Benny special, they appeared together. There's this wonderful moment in, I think it's Jack Benny's bag of the first farewell special, where he, where Jack has Eddie Anderson out on stage at the very end of the show. Mm-hmm. And he says, uh, Jack says, you know, hey, Rochester, why about what happens if, what would happen if we make a show just like before and we go back to having you be my servant? And Eddie Anderson as Rochester says, boss, it'll play well and we don't do that anymore. And then Jack says, yeah, you're right. Let's just be friends and go out and get a hamburger together. That is so. Yeah. So that is the difficulty about talking about issues that are so important to us today, such as racial equality, gender equality, um, diversity. The past, we've come a long way from the past, and that's where um, we've got to talk through and understand right. why these things happened in the past. Not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but not to give them an, um, an absolute pass on things that they did back then that we go, oh, no, 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 you're not going to do that today. Thank you for letting me talk about it. It's not something that you can give a one-sentence answer to. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is true. Uh, that And that's a perfect kind of question for a podcast, exploring those kinds of questions. Um so I have seen brief mentions of the scandal with George Burns and Jack with uh, that were they smuggled like or were accused of smuggling jewels. Um, how? First of all, what what happened and how did he survive that? If sur- if sponsors would have pulled out he his career could have taken a drastic turn sure it's a, a fascinating story um both to go back to the time and to understand that it could have been the jack end of jack benny's career and that the scandal was a combination of naivete and stupidity 
somebody taking advantage of of Jack and George and their and Gracie and Mary, um, and um, anti-Semitism at the time. So all these things boil together into this celebrity scandal. It started out with the naivete and stupidity of somebody trying to take advantage of them. Of Jack and Mary and George and Gracie were on a European trip. And while traveling around, they met this guy, a minor State Department official, somebody, you know, doing the diplomatic stuff in Europe. And he, uh, the guy, I don't remember his name offhand, um, uh, try, the, the, the small-time diplomat wanted to be a big man and to be able to, to um, uh, uh, brag to his friends that he was great close friends with entertainers like George Burns and Jack Benny. So to sidle up to these guys and go, hey, you want to buy jewelry for your pretty ladies, for your wives? Um, if we put it in my diplomatic pouch, I'll bring it back to the States. You'll save like $100 on the um, uh, 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 the taxes, on the duties you go. Hey, and, and I'll be doing you this favor, and you'll be my friend. And, and the guy, and Jack and George were so stupid. They, you know, I mean, so naive. They, it just seemed a small matter to them, $100, that they were going to save on the taxes, right? So so they, they agreed to let the guy do it. And they all got back to the States, and it was all fine. And it turns out that the minor uh, diplomatic official was in, like, Detroit, Michigan, um, where he, he's, he had this whole network of people he played big with. And he loved to brag on these stories about all these famous people who he'd done these sort of these under-the-table favors for. And he's loudly telling this tale, tale at somebody's house. And the somebody's house in Michigan had a, um, uh, what I want to say, a housekeeper cook made a housekeeper who was a member of the German-American Bund. And she um, was a Hitler enthusiast and she hated anything to do with Jews and she um and so perhaps this diplomat was possibly over a, a, also of Jewish American heritage and she said this is terrible he's taking advantage and he's a you know a, a, a rat rat that that Jew and so she says I'm gonna slip this information to the Justice Department I'm gonna tell J. Edgar Hoover so the housekeeper snitches on the um, on the minor diplomat and said he's been doing bad things and all and this Jewish conspiracy to rip off the American government. Well, people in the Justice Department who enjoy who perhaps might also uh, uh, enjoy um, uh, taking down celebrities, perhaps not thinking very well of Jewish American celebrities decide to make a show trial of it. Hey, I'm going to be a big guy. And so makes it huge um, headlines that famous performers, Jack Benny and George Burns, as well as it ruined the career of a judge in New York, that the minor diplomat had been sneaking in jewelry for the wife of a famous judge who ended up getting fired from his bench. But so there was this huge show trial. And if you look on eBay, you'll find newspapers playing up the trial, you know, that's, it'd be the, you know, with, uh, celebrities today get in trouble for various things, and isn't it, you know, great fodder for uh, uh, newspapers and gossip columns and things like that, so Jack Benny had been completely clean before, but what an opportunity to rag on Mr. Good Guy, and, and, and so, it was horrible. Um, uh, Jack was not getting good advice. You know, he said, I didn't do anything wrong. They, as I said, they wanted to make it a show trial. They ended up, the Justice Department ended up fining him $10,000 for what would have been saving $100 of not paying the taxes on the jewelry. But that kind of, um, uh, 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 what I want to say, all those newspaper headlines, all that gossip, um, um, really, they, he was Jack was terrified that his sponsor Jello was going to say we can't have our product associated with that. Right. Um, um, it was Jello might well have canceled him. Um, uh, his uh, advertising agency Young and Rubicam might well have dropped him. His career could have been completely over. Right. Luckily, they were able. You know, they tested the waters, and people, you know, the public was willing to forgive. You know, as I said, unlike. We're seeing, you know, for different reasons and, and people's careers ruined for really bad and awful behavior. But as I said, so um, luckily 
Jack and George were able to overcome the scandal and um, and and move on. Uh, I think with the handy um, uh, uh, PR work of uh, the Young and Rubicam ad agency. So um, uh, uh, it's a great story to explore. Uh, it's been downplayed. Of course, that's what Jack would have wanted. And I'll tell you, in his scrapbooks, which are uh, housed at the University of Wyoming, for some reason, while every other part of his public life is documented in newspaper articles and things like that, there's not a single article. Right. It's a blip. Yeah, about this whole scandal. So, you, you know, that to me shows as much as, as Jack publicly tried to downplay it. Really, it wasn't that so bad, and it was a really minor thing. To think. I think he was terrified, and the fact that they, they absolutely, you know, kept everything out of what they wanted to remember just shows how humiliating and horrifying the whole thing right. was. So, to move briefly to Fred Allen, um, did Fred Allen and Benny meet about talking about what they were going to do each week, or did they just kind of react each week? Did they not talk about it? Did their writer teams not talk about it, or was it a collaboration? It's a little bit of both. It was a collaboration, but they said it's a, a collaboration through that advertising agency, Young and Rubicam. Mm -hmm. I, it's so interesting what neither side ever wanted to talk about because the feud was famous, and both Benny and Alan enjoyed getting the um, approval, the um, the hearty congratulations for how successful the feud was. It actually does turn out that the thing was actually, I mean, because you can hear or, or read in the early scripts of Jack Benny shows that don't exist. He's been, Jack Benny had been ragging on Fred Allen and, and all the other comedians from, from day one, not in a concerted way, but making occasional, you know, joking insults of all the other comedians. And Fred had been doing the same. Mm -hmm. It just so happens that when in um, December 1936, um, that uh, uh, Fred Allen, uh, on his amateur show, uh, uh, having the, the, the young boy who could play the bee, mm -hmm. makes some cracks about this, this you know, um, a young boy can play violin so much better than Jack Benny. Um, a, uh, uh, an account agent at the um, uh, uh, advertising agency, Young and Rubicam, said, Hey, here's an opportunity. At that point, the agency was in charge of both the Fred Allen and Jack Benny shows. And so they said, even though they're on different networks, and Fred was based in New York, and Jack was based in Los Angeles, and they didn't get off, you know, phone calls were expensive, and they, they, they had no idea what each other was really doing other than listening to each other mm -hmm. on the radio. It was actually somebody at the advertising agency who said, hey, guys, here's a publicity stunt. Why don't you really ramp it up and start a feud with Jack Benny? And Jack, why don't you do this with Fred Allen? And both of them said, okay. What you can find in Fred Allen's papers, I got this great chance to see them at the um, Boston Public Library. Oh. And what Fred would do was he would attack, because Fred pretty much wrote his own scripts. And he would attach like three pages to the front of each week's script, having written it at the last minute, what new insults he's going to make about Jack Benny. Jack, on the other hand, and his writers, who would be, um, uh, this was, and Harry Kahn was gone, so it was Morrow and Boulogne at this point, and they would labor and think of some insults about Fred Allen. And indeed, in the original feud, they could never come up with any good insults very many good insults about Fred Allen, but boy, was did Allen have a field day making fun of Jack Benny. So the two enjoyed it. As I said, the impetus was actually under the table. Their ad agency said, yes! And indeed, he wanted the um, ad agency guy wanted to do it for publicity's sake. Mm -hmm. And it was everywhere in the news, in the gossip magazines, in the newspapers. People were talking about it around water coolers. It was a huge publicity stunt that drove up the, you know, it did everything. It certainly worked. <laughs> it certainly worked. But thank you. It's, you know, if you go back and listen to them all, they're not that funny. You know, after a while, it, to me, the funniest part of the Benny Allen feud is what Jack and Fred do years later. Those episodes in the late 40s and 1950s where they'll spend whole episodes. 
start reimagining their vaudeville careers. Mm-hmm. And it will become more like a Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck kind of I hate you, I want one up on you, I'm, I want one up on you. We're telling those long stories of insults about each other, about who had the greater vaudeville career, who stole mm-hmm. this show from, from each other. I think so. To me, that's the greatest joke back on Young and Rubicam. Years later, when they're with different sponsors and different advertising agencies, they continue, you know, they, they bring up the feud, and it's only going to benefit each other. Uh, but I, I, so uh, I, I think that the, the, the joke, the, the joke is then in the hands of Jack and Fred and, and not Young and Ruby Cam. Yay. How, how many writers did Fred Allen have? Um, because, uh, I heard that he doesn't really have as much as some of the others in, um, radio is. I mean, th- did he mostly do it by him himself, or how, how did that work? Fred Allen is an interesting character. Um, uh, very prickly. I understand a person who, he was not a great, he was very sort of dour and dim and sort of, sort of dark humor, so I understand he wasn't the greatest guy to be around, but he was a comedy genius. And he, he lived a very simple life, he and his wife, Portland just had a small apartment in New York, and he basically wrote most all the shows by himself. He, uh, from what I've read, he always, he usually had a writer or two on the side, sometimes young folks, to help flush out various parts or to help generate ideas mm-hmm. um, uh, that, that Fred would then work on. Um, the oh, um, the guy who's n- there's one fellow who goes on to be a famous novelist who wrote an autobiography about what it was like to work with Fred when he was young. And um, and he said that I write these things, and then by the time they went on the air, Fred would either have thrown them out or so completely rewritten them that I don't I don't recognize it at all. Right. That's so cool. That's um, cool Fred worked like very, that. very hard. He, he, um, he took pride in doing most of all of it himself. He would have a couple of other folks on hand, as I said, to help out or to try and give him some new ideas. Other writers, like Eddie Cantor, frankly never wrote a single thing himself. I can have you talk to an Eddie Cantor scholar who might disagree. Um, another friend of mine has written a biography of Eddie Cantor recently. It's a wonderful book. It's called The Eddie Cantor Story by <laughs> David Weinstein. There's my plug for my friend. Um, Eddie Cantor had um, that guy, Dave Friedman write scripts for him, and Dave Friedman was the one who had a, um, a joke file of 100,000 jokes, oh. and he would pull a couple dozen jokes from the file every week, change a few words, and then have Eddie, Eddie Cantor read them out. Bob Hope had six writers, and he was so mean to them. He would literally, he would treat them like dirt, and then uh, each week at paycheck time, uh, Bob Hope would stand on the top of a staircase at his house. And, and um, hold the checks out and make the writers have to jump for the checks like they were trained dogs. Uh. Trying to, oh, it's just awful. So various comedy shows did various different things. On the Fibber McGee and Molly show, they had one basic writer um, um, uh, named Quinn and, a, and some people who helped on the side. So some comics were very much involved in writing their own things. Mm-hmm. Others um, uh, uh, had the writers do everything for them. Some had a revolving round table of writers. Others stuck with um, a writing team for a long time. It's so interesting to learn how the various shows did it differently. Um, Jack was very loyal to his writers. His writers were always paid by him. And, and this he did this on purpose so that he could have more control over the script. If the writers had been hired by the advertising agency and the sponsor, then the sponsor would have more call to say, you're never going to make jokes about X, or I want the show to do this. When Jack hired his writers, he could say, no, no, we're just going to present you the whole show. And you can either like the whole show or dislike the whole show, but you're not going to meddle. In my show, I'm sorry. Such long answers for such no. a good question, but it's all you about learning. You don't have to keep apologizing no. for that. <laughs> um, so I've recently learned about this guy called Frank Fay. Who is Frank Fay? Oh yes, 
Tell me about Frank Fay. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know much about Frank Fay except that he um, influenced Benny a lot. Yes, Frank Fay is one of the biggest jerks of all time. He has forgotten today, mostly because he was such an unpleasant person. Um, he was also very racist. Um, uh, yeah, Frank Fay, a totally unlovable kind of guy. He was one of he was Barbara Stanwyck's first husband. So today he's chiefly known as the jerk she married, and then she went on to a great career while his crashed and burned, a kind of um, star is born mm -hmm. kind of story. And he had one last hurrah. He played the original role in the show Harvey, which was made into a movie with um, uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart yeah. about the, the, the genially drunk guy who imagines his best friend is a six-foot-tall rabbit. Well, so Frank Fay was an absolute role model for Jack Benny back in those early days of vaudeville. And what we can appreciate that Frank Fay did that was um, uh, innovative in the world of vaudeville was previously most comics in vaudeville had worn some kind of ethnic getup or they looked like clowns. You wore a funny big red nose. You pretended to be Irish or German. You wore strange beards or you dressed up in blackface. With, you know, with makeup on your face. So most comedians, and this is talking back in about 1900 and the early 1900s, um, as I said, went for the visual yucks, looking, you know, like baggy pants to comics, looking like that. Frank Fay was one of the first who said, I'm going to wear the nicest looking evening clothes. I'm going to come out polished. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm, although he's Irish American, he says, I'm going to have a cultivated accent. I'm going to look so wealthy. I'm going to look so polished and debonair. Mm -hmm. And so he dressed to the night instead of looking like a clown. And he came out to the front of the stage. He was a storyteller. Um, and, and he told one of his most famous stories was a long one about a family that saved string. And he would tell these sort of long stories about families gathering string into giant balls. And so these sort of genial little stories, sort of quiet. He's looking really sharp. Except Frank Fay, if, if anybody heckled him, he was the most wicked. He could just reduce a heckler to a puddle of butter, you know, in an instant. So he, had, he was just wicked. And, and the public just loved him. He's so suave. He's so smart. You know, he's just the coolest stand-up comic. So he's one of the ones to kind of invent the world of stand-up comedy. Um, and Benny, Jack Benny, as he was saying, what, how am I going to create my own character? Jack Benny liked to dress up and look good. And as he was putting down the violin and saying, I'm going to start to tell jokes, there's a role model for you. I'm going to dress good. I'm going to come out. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to come up with some stories to tell. The one difference is that Jack Benny, A, wasn't racist and mean and a total jerk like Frank Bay. And, um, um, uh, B still played the violin on occasion, and C was never mean to hecklers. How about that? So, but um, reviewers in the vaudeville industry, like seeing who's going to play the palace and things like that, yeah. oftentimes made the connection about whoa, Jack Benny, you're coming up with something new, but you're kind of a lot like that guy who was here this week, Frank Bay. Right. A couple of other guys were too, but as I said, so Bay was a role model, but he's not much remembered today other than for being a mega jerk. Hooray that Jack Benny wasn't a jerk. This is true. <laughs> if we're going to spend, if we're going to find, you know, entertainers that we're going to spend a lot of time, you know, enjoying, it sure does help if they're not jerks. So. Yeah. Do kids in your class end up listening or watching Jack Benny after your class? Have any of them, like, told you that they've started listening and watching some of the performers that are mentioned in class? Yes, and that always makes my heart flutter. I'm so happy. One thing, I, it's, it's hard to get students. To, as I said, in, I have a class of 200, and how do you get them to listen to a radio program? You know, they're sitting there, they're all on their iPads, on their computers. They're not paying attention. But I give them an assignment in class. It seems to work and get some interested in Jack Benny. I play part of the episode um, the famous one he first that Jack first did on radio with Claudette Colbert, when he's going to be going to her, he's barging into, she is um, rehearsing a play with perhaps Basil Rathbone, oh. and they're rehearsing a drama, and Jack says, comes up with this reason of saying, I want to 
by with Basil Rathbone, or later he we did this episode two or three or four times on the radio. Eventually, it was Vincent Price, mm-hmm. and you, you may have uh, perhaps you've heard this episode that he ends up at like Claudette Colbert's house buying. Uh, like he wants to barge into the play rehearsal, and he uh, 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 and so he gets insulted by everybody, and eventually he takes the play part of um, the butler. And he just he messes he he messes up the um, rehearsal every way possible. It's a very funny thing. That's why he did it three or four times. But he did it on an early television episode. And so I have the students listen to about the, the fifteen minutes, the best part of the radio episode, and then we watch Jack do it again on television. And I have them try to pay attention to um, trying to understand what was a radio joke versus how did it change for television? How did Jack use the same words but add visual reactions? How did he cut some lines but then add some things that work really well in a visual medium in in early television? And they end up getting really interested. They go, hey, that Jack Benny is a pretty fun guy. Yay. And they then sort of understand what it was like for all those performers who tried to move from one medium to another. Everything that was involved in trying to change everything you've been doing for 25 years on the radio to that new medium of television. So, so yes, yay! They they um they watch Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton films. They listen to Jack Benny and perhaps War of the Worlds. Um, they they watch early television. Um, thank goodness for YouTube that uh, yes. people have posted. You know that it's so easy. It yeah. would be different if it was the world I grew up in, where there were just three TV channels, and you know, there, in the world before even VHS tapes and DVDs. As I said, uh, me and my five Jack Benny cassette tapes. It was so difficult back then, and it's so easy right now that I, so I, I feel like a. Um, a Baptist preacher, you know, kind of proselytizing for the wonders of old media. It's out there. Watch it. That is, that is cool to know that they're um, getting into it because I know that is my struggle even with my peers is to be like, no, you don't understand. Like, this is amazing. Like, uh, I was watching a Dick Cavett episode um, where Jack's playing the violin, and I was recording it, and I was like, I was like recording myself or myself in the break room, saying like he's going to play it bad, and then he doesn't play it bad, and I start freaking out. A friend, a friend walks in and is like, "What are you doing?" And I was like. No, you don't understand. I've never seen this before. I've tried to look for it on YouTube. It's not there. And she's like, what? That's fantastic. Well, that's the power of of great comedy. If so many years later, we can still engage with it. And, you know, hooray, hopefully Jack is looking down at us from somewhere going, you know, I win. You know, years afterwards, it's I've left something funny behind. So, I, I it certainly brightens my day. Um, okay, just for fun, since you are a professor, are you aware of your ratings on RateMyProfessor.com? <laughs> no, that's I, I. I kind of don't look. I don't. I don't want to know. But but I will tell you one story back. I used to back when Rick, my professors had a chili pepper. Okay, I'm 58 years old. Do they not have now, a chili pepper anymore? No, they took off the chili pepper. What? In, <laughs> well, because of the Me Too movement, right? Oh, so, God, you God. know, that's a but. Back in the days of the chili that pepper. The, that's recent, because I just... It's very yeah. recent. It's just this summer, I think, oh, they took okay. But, so back in the day, <laughs> I'd never get a chili pepper. I'm 58. I'm not, you know, that's... But I used to go play trivia with my husband at a place where the trivia master happened to be a Jack Benny fan. Mm-hmm. And it was a great game of trivia playing with other folks our age and older and things like that. And I occasionally I would joke to him about not getting a chili pepper. When I moved to Texas, he gave me a, the trivia master gave me a goodbye present. He, he gave me a, um, uh, an eight by 10 photo of Jack Benny 
and he signed it. He had practiced Jack Benny's signature, and he fake autographed it to me, and he said to Kathy, one hot, one red hot chili pepper, love Jack Benny. <laughs> so, no, I've not seen, I, I, I've, I've seen my regular evaluations. It's frightening enough, <laughs> uh, but uh, hopefully they're kind. So, they are what, kind, what, by the yeah, way. They are kind. Oh, good. I don't think I saw a bad review. Oh, so, good, good, good. Yes. I was going to say I pay them well. No, I don't pay them. But um, <laughs> I, I'm a, I'm a, I always call myself a very fortunate person. Um, getting to talk about history and media history and um, uh, show people my excitement for it and how interesting it can be to learn about the stuff, to experience it, to do research about it. I, I like to, um, uh, I like to model that kind of interest and joy. And if I can infect a couple students, then, you know, hooray, I've done, mm -hmm. I've done my work. If I can show people that history doesn't suck, um, <laughs> that history isn't necessarily what they had in high school with the basketball coach, you know, for teaching, you know, history and you hated it or history being just one long, one long memorization game of presidents and wars and dates and things like that. It's like, if, if it can really, you know, that's, it can be really interesting insights and wonderful stories. If you get to the story in history, For sure. then I think it's pretty cool. Yes. So. Um, so what, one last question. Why do you think it's important to remember Jack Benton? Well, you've given us so many good reasons already in this podcast, and thank you so much. This has been a delightful experience. Um, as you say, you do the genealogy, and, and you can still get um, uh, folks today, Stephen Colbert, to David Letterman, to Johnny Carson. You can do the genealogy, um, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, to this, to that. That other comics will say that they model, you know, that they found Benny was a formative influence. Mm -hmm. You can say that look what he was doing on the vaudeville stage, even back at the beginning of his career, was helping to invent stand up. And um, his kind of stand up was like inventing the talk show host. Um, you can say that what he did to survive in early radio was to invent the early workplace situation comedy. By cre instead of just telling a string of jokes, by creating um, uh, characters, he was, even if they were just standing around the microphone, who have identifiable quirks, and who, when the comedy can come from conversations and those characters having adventures, instead of just that joke file of a hundred thousand jokes about three ducks walking to a bar, and um, then that's you you given the world comedy tools for, you know, creating comedy from here through, you know, uh, hopefully eternity. Um, that's a great reason to um, uh, honor him for what he started and what he perfected. But, as I said, I also say that much like the way that we consider Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton or the Marx Brothers, not just great old comedians, but classics for all time that we just want to experience and we forget Sometimes we get past the fact that it's old and black and white or even silent, and we appreciate it. I'm hoping that we'll get Jack Benny and some of the other great sort of 20th century comedians to that stage of being classics. That we, that it, um, hooray with the rise um, of podcasts. That now people are seeking out podcasts. Well, now maybe they'll also seek out radio episodes to listen to. That, um, uh, that we can get past all oh, that old stuff. And, and appreciate the, the best of a career full of comedy uh, or something that we can enjoy today. Right, maybe uh, people that do podcasts should look, because it's a very similar medium now, like uh, old radio and podcasts is uh, very similar in many ways. So I think people could do well to look back and see how old radio did it. Sure. There are websites. There's a, a great one. Um, uh, I know it. Uh, if you look up Hot Rod, H-O-T space R-O-D, Old Time Radio, there's a website with 70,000 old radio broadcasts, all digitized into MP3s, that it's so easy to find this stuff. Mm -hmm. Amazing science fiction stuff, amazing dramas, amazing adaptation of classic Hollywood movies. There are so many cool things out there to find. As, as much as we 
are in this world today of, of 500 scripted shows available, uh, you know, between Amazon and Netflix and Hulu and all these other, we're swimming in so, and hundreds of podcasts, we're swimming in great media to listen to, but I, I hope amongst all this great new media to listen to that people might um, go out and, and find these other marvelous old things and put it in their mix. For sure, I definitely hope for that as well. Um, this isn't really, I don't have a question or anything, but you were talking about genealogy, and that kind of uh, reminded me of uh, Conan, who, I, I, when I watch Conan, he has a great respect for some of the classic comedians. He has Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks on a lot, and he, he's clearly influenced by Johnny Carson, and he did, like, a special for Johnny Carson, but what what I found interesting is there was one day where um, him and Andy were, they said something about Jack Benny, and Conan turns to the camera and he says, they don't know who Jack Benny is. This is funny to us, but, like, they don't know who Jack Benny is. And I found that, like, kind of, I found it sad, but also, like, it's it's good like you can tell that like every he made it a joke so you know that like everybody's there's going to be people that are like oh they look they look it up and it's I, I think that's kind of amazing now hooray that yes no it's it's both yes and because uh, i'll ask my 200 students at the start of the semester who's ever heard of jack benny and not a single one, one person well, I'll get one raised hand that goes, my grandparents talk about that. You know, that, that's cool. Um, but you're right. So sometimes by even just mentioning the name and, and, and getting the curious people to go out and find out about new things. But the media world, soon it's going to be, it's going to be so hard for us to have anything in common anymore. As I said, with 500 different shows available, hundreds of broadcasts, there's so much to listen to. Um, you, we won't be able to have anything in common. So, indeed, we need to, to get out and tell each other about things we enjoy um, because um, there's such a variety that, uh, of, of things. There's an overwhelming number of things that we could know about. Um, and how do you choose? Right. So, uh, uh, indeed, tell everybody you know about how wonderful Jack Benny is, and, and, and we'll keep it going. And the, the, I mean, that's the point of this podcast is like, I want, there's so many mediums now, there's so many different things out there that like these people spent like 30 years or more, like growing their careers and it, they influenced history and yet uh, people are, are forgetting them simply because there's so many things out there now that the that it's it's becoming uh, washed away, and sure. I think that is that we need to bring it back. And so I feel like that's what I'm trying to do is trying to bring it back in a way that's interesting, that's uh, cool per se. I don't know if it's cool, but <laughs> it's cool to yeah. me. So. Uh, see if I can bring it to a new medium that's trying to, um, you know, make it, keep it relevant. So, Sure. Well, uh, hooray for what you're doing, but that's actually, you know, that's, again, one of the best things about all these new medium forums, media forums, is that instead of just sort of silently sit back, sitting back and going, oh, nobody knows about Jack Benny anymore, hooray for these media that let us make podcasts, to still write and publish books, to, to do, um, you know, videos, I mean, uh, uh, documentaries that might end up on PBS, because then we become the active creators of history. And we say this stuff is, we're, we're going to pull it back up and say, this is worth knowing about this. These are great stories. So um, hooray that we get to um, uh, uh, play a part, an active part in helping to, to um, push this history forward and what ought to be known. Uh, and then we can leave the boring people in mm -hmm. the in the right. dust behind us. How about that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, thank you so much for doing this. Well, um, many congratulations to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. 
I look forward to getting to meet you in other, other places and times. It was so much fun to talk to Kathy. She and I are both members of the International Jack Benny Fan Club on Facebook if you are a fan of Benny and want to check that out. Also, if you're a fan, I once again recommend her book, Jack Benny and the Golden Age of American Radio Comedy. It has some wonderful insight. There's so much to explore in the world of Benny, and the book does a pretty good job of presenting things that maybe you didn't know that are very informative and interesting, especially if you are a fan of classics. Which, if you're a fan of classics, then... That's probably why you're on this podcast, so I recommend it. So thank you for listening, and I will catch you later.